Amen. Those of you who have children, grandchildren, I'm telling you, don't stop praying for them. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't quit. God inspired me yesterday with this message. My dad was a good dad to me. He tried to raise me right. He had his problems. But he tried to teach me right. I was telling Matthew this yesterday. And I want to tell this. When I was 16, I came to this altar, knelt at it, surrendered to preach on a Sunday night. Brother Golf preaching the message, must Jesus bear his cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. When my mom, my dad was working out of town that night, Corps of Engineers, and when my mom called him, got a hold of him, that night and told him what had happened, my dad told my mom, I think he's a little too young to decide something like that. He wasn't all for it, I don't think. But, I mean, I love my dad. I didn't hold it against him. But I knew what God wanted me to do. I felt that strongly about it. Fast forward to 1990. Lisa and I were called out to the Richwoods First Free Will Baptist Church. Out in Richwoods, Missouri. That's at A-Frame Church in Richwoods. I used to drive by there and say, boy, that's a pretty church. And I never knew what, never knew what kind it was. Didn't pay attention to the sign. Just a beautiful A-Frame Church. Never knew that I'd get to pastor there one day. And uh, God called Lisa and I out there. Generally, when you are or had to have an ordination service, they voted me in, 100% vote. Generally, when you have an ordination service, um, you call a preacher that you know or somebody, that they'll come preach the service for you. I called three preachers, couldn't get anybody to preach the service for me. So I preached my own. I think God was sort of leading me out of the denomination back then. Because I really, I mean, I couldn't get anybody to come. If there was one member of the executive board there at that church who was a deacon of the church had he not been there there would have been nobody on the executive board to lay hands on me to confer the office of bishop to me for that church so i preached the message my dad came i preached the message the elder man of the church came down brother kevin pogue who was the deacon of the church and on the executive board came and laid hands on me and conferred to me the office of bishop or pastor, was ordained that night. And as I walked over to my dad, my dad hugged me and he said, Son, I'm proud of you. Well, that just blew me apart. That my dad would say that. And I guess it took me leaving the house and kind of go down on my own, my dad finally started going to church with my mom down in DeSoto. God began to deal with his heart. God began to minister to him. And I saw a change in my dad's life. I saw a change in the old dawn. And I saw a new one. We was on our way down, me and Sterling and my dad, we was on our way down to West Plains to go deer hunting. And I was kind of laid, you know me, I like to lay in the back, sleep and rest while somebody else drives. Well, Ster I think Sterling was driving and my dad was sitting up front and him, they were talking. I heard them talking. And my dad said to Sterling, Sterling, if the Lord hadn't delivered that beer from me drinking it, he said, I'd be dead right now, but the Lord took it away from me. And I'm just wanting to go, woo, woo. And then, September 29th, 2011, my sister called and said, they're taking Dad to the ER. Well, we were used to Dad being in the hospital. So I really didn't think much of it. 
And I was actually on a highway in Festus when she called. And I said, well, I'll, I'm almost there. I'll, I'll go right over there. And I went over to the hospital. Mom was there. They brought Dad in by ambulance. He was in a lot of pain. We think it was an aneurysm. But I went into the room. Mom was there. Nurses were there. They were hooking him up, different things, doing different things. And then all of a sudden, it was just me and Dad in the room. No nurses, no doctors. Mom had stepped out. And the Lord said, pray. And I grabbed my daddy's hand. Last night, as I was looking at this message, I was just in tears. Because I had my hands out like this. Wanting to feel my daddy's hand. And I took my daddy's hand. I said, Dad, let's pray. He said, yeah, let's do that. The last thing that my father did in this world was pray. You don't get it better than that. You don't get death better than that. And it wasn't too long after that, his eyes rolled back. And they run everybody out. They revived him about four times. And I finally said, God, that's enough. You can have him. One thing that my dad taught me without ever saying a word. Take your Bible, turn to Luke 2 while I'm talking this. Luke chapter 2. It's not on the screen. One thing my dad taught me without ever saying a word, he expressed it. I've told this story before, but... We were at a father and son banquet at the church he went to. And Brother Bob Tebow was there. And while the ladies were preparing all the food and getting everything ready, we were in a room together. And Brother Bob said, I'd like for any man in here to stand and testify of something your father taught you. Now, I'm sitting there with my dad. My dad is like Brother Sterling. They don't stand and talk in church. And for Brother Sterling to give his testimony here a few weeks ago, I, my jaw just dropped. We was all crying. We was all clapping our hands, celebrating. And my dad stood right up. All six foot seven inches of him. And I went. And he said, Brother Bob, my dad... The day I married Judy, took me aside, and he said, Son, I want to tell you something. You always treat your family like they were your friends. If you go somewhere, they go with you. If you're going to go over here, they're going to go with you. If you're going to be out of town, they're going to go out of town with you. And my dad said that, at my, and I'm just in tears, because... He did that all of our life, didn't he, sis? Didn't he, Trish? They went somewhere, we went with them. If dad had to go out of town and work, he got a, a hotel with a kitchenette. You remember those? He got a room big enough so that when school was out, mom and me and sis could go out and be with him the rest of the summer while he was working out of town. And he made sure that we were there with him. Everywhere. When he went to uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, they had an E5 tornado, wiped that town out. They hired him to go down, and, and they were setting up mobile homes, and he was inspecting the, the setup of them. That was his job, was an inspector. And he made the uh, accommodations so that when school let out, it was close to summer anyway, we went down to Wichita Falls, Texas, and my dad loved me so much that he got me a job. And I was working seven days a week out in that Texas heat, eating that red Texas dust, making $100 a week, 13 years old. That's how much my dad loved me. He got me a job and said, you're in work. Oh, I can stand here and tell stories. 
But it occurred to me yesterday that when God sent Jesus to this world, He created a family. Luke chapter 2, let's tell you what let's do. Let's stand as we honor the Word of God this morning in reverence to the Word of God. That's biblical, by the way. It's in the book of Ezra, I think, or Nehemiah, one of those two. I get those mixed up. And let's read this. To, let's read this. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. It all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Right here, God made a family. Do you understand that? A family. Joseph was a spouse to Mary. He was, that means they were engaged, but it was a legal engagement. That means if it was to be broken, it was to be broken by a legal divorce. That's how espousement worked back then. You just didn't engage somebody and say, well, you marry me and that'd be it. And then the two people get mad and fly off and end up in court somewhere or just, just walking away from each other. It was a legally binding engagement. And this was to be Joseph's wife. So now Mary has given birth. God the Father is the Father of Jesus Christ. Joseph is going to help raise Jesus. But we have the beginning now of a family. And I want us to think about that this morning as we pray. Think about the family that God has given you. Whether it be your own kin, husband and wife, children, grandchildren whether it be the family of America that still believes that this country was formed under God. That's our family. And you'll find them all over this country. A lot of them have still got Trump stickers on their car. But we're family. And then, uh, let me, let's pray. Father, bless this message. Help me to preach it, God. Lord, I, I just got so much out of this studying it last night. Lord, I don't know if I can do it today. I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for what you've done in our lives, in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless this message, bless these people. I thank you for them. I thank you for this church. And, Lord, how you bless this church. God, you, say, you saved the ministries of this church single-handedly by yourself. You worked a miracle in saving what amounts to some of the greatest thing that this church has ever done. You saved it, Father, so we could keep doing it. Lord, I thank you, God, for your miracle working. And Father, there are many miracles that we're asking you for. As far as our family goes, Lord, bless our family. Bless all of our families, dear God, and help us to remember that you created the family. Families are of you. Bless this message, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. If you would, follow with me on the screen. I want every man to look at this. I want you to look at your Bible, Genesis 2, 18. I want every man to look at this, and I want you to amen this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I want every man here to say amen. 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 You, know what, you know what? I will make an help meet for him. You know what God was really saying here? And he was being nice. But you know what God was saying to all of us men, Matthew? Adam, you are too stupid to live on your own. You need somebody to help you, stop you from killing yourself. Amen. 
God said it in a much nicer way. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him help meet for him. And at this point, God has began the process of creating something that even predates the church. It was the family. Before there was a church, before there was a congregation of Israel, there was a family. Somebody say amen. Genesis 2 verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, instead thereof. God signifying to us men, I'm going to make her to be from your side, to be by your side. In Japan, the woman has to walk five steps behind the man. That's ridiculous. God took the rib out of our side, of Adam's side. I'm taking it out of his side so that she is to be by your side. Amen. Amen. God told us men, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And when God finally picked a wife for me, God not only picked a wife that was from the same religious thinking, but she was from the same denomination and from the same church. God picked a wife for me from the very same church that I'd been a part of all my life. Now, I, I'm not saying that's got to happen to everybody, and it's probably not possible for it to happen to everybody, but that's the blessing that God gave to me, was that I married somebody who thought the same way that I thought, and when I went off stupid, changing my mind, God used my wife to help bring me back to thinking the way I should be thinking. Amen. Amen. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Woman has the word man in it. You are, ladies, you are the wool man. You're the help meet to help your husband from blowing the house up. Amen. Therefore shall a man, listen to this, shall a man leave his father and mother. The man leaves one family. Leave that family. He's going to start his own family. Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. You know what that means? They are not to be separated. Not to be uncleaved. Don't let anybody split up. Amen. I know there's people in here been divorced. Hopefully you've learned your lesson. And now God's cleaved you together with a wife. Don't divorce ever again. Something goes wrong in your marriage, let God fix it. Don't let the devil cleave a marriage. Amen? There's a lot here, amen? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And that's it. this Bible's right. It's not a metaphor. It's exactly right. Because Genesis 2.25, and they were both, watch this, watch this. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed. I thought, and God stopped me and said, I wasn't going to put that in my notes. And God stopped me and said, Mike, I want you to sit for a while and think about that for a minute. Think about what it means. Not the, you know, the frisky romance part. They're naked in front of each other. Think of what it means. That a man and a woman together, they ought to be shameless, which means... The man 
should never ever be ashamed of his wife and the wife should never ever be ashamed of her husband. That means, men, don't do things that will bring shame to your family. Don't do them. That means, ladies, don't do things that will bring shame to your husband or to your marriage where your husband says, I, I'm not going to be with you ever. I'm not going to be with you. You think you're going to live that way? Or the wife says to the husband, you think you're going to live that way and keep me around here? And you husbands out there, don't use that thing. God, God hates divorce. You can't divorce me. God hates divorce. God divorced Israel. Am I right? Am I right? God divorced Israel. Why? He was just ashamed of her. She went too far and slutted herself out, harlotted herself out way too far, and God said, I'm writing a bill of divorce. Done. I'm done with you. Get out. And God kicked his wife, who he was a spouse to, out of his house. Husbands and wives, you're to be shameless before one another. Number two, when you're both naked, there are no secrets. That means there's to be an openness in your marriage. Husbands and wives nowadays are keeping too many secrets. Usually they're on their phone. The secrets are all on their phone. Google knows about them. Apple knows about them. NSA knows about them. But your husband doesn't or your wife doesn't. Don't keep secrets in your marriage. Behave. Okay? Now, does everybody understand what God is saying in that, in that verse? That's good. God, to, God told me, don't pass that up, Mike. That was good stuff, wasn't it? Now, look at this. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Well, we all know how that, how that went. And understand that sometimes kids will go astray. And they won't come back. It happens. It happens out of the best of families. Even those who think, well, I, I've homeschooled my children. I don't let them watch this. I don't let them watch that. I don't do this. I don't do that. Ask Josh Duggar. Ask Josh Duggar. Did being homeschooled and not having a television at his house Stop him from turning bad. He's in prison now for what, 20 years? Sometimes the kids go bad. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. The family started and she again bare his brother Abel, but the family split up. The family was... The devil destroyed this family because Cain killed his brother. Now Cain and his lineage gets wiped out in the flood. And Cain's lineage does not exist on this earth anywhere. Don't give me that nonsense. Well, that, 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 they somehow said they survived. I don't, I don't believe that. They were wiped out in the flood. And they do not exist anywhere in this world. And Abel's dead. Abel didn't even have a, have a time to have a child. But God, listen, God, where, that, where the devil busted up, God made it right. 
Look at Genesis 4.25. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bare a son, called his name Seth. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And Seth was a far better son. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says. And Seth to him also there was born a son. He called his name Enos. Then began, began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And you have the beginning of the family unit here. Now watch this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Turn there in your Bible. I'm telling you, the family, whether it's, if, if you can't have peace in your own blood family, which happens, bless God. I was so thankful yesterday, and I'm not, I can't brag on this, I can't boast on this, because I think I've done just about everything wrong as a dad to ruin my children but I had them all there yesterday with all my grandkids in the same room together considering myself to be the richest man in the world because I still had my family. And I know, I know, it, ain't, I know it ain't like that in every family. I know you, families bust up. Sin gets involved. People do stupid stuff. They, they lie and cheat and steal to their own family. And families bust up. And they can't even stand to see each other at the funeral. But when that happens, God can give you a better family. Amen. Matthew 1, 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary espoused to Joseph before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her... See, he didn't want to be ashamed of her. What did I just preach? And look at your Bible. Look at what Joseph is doing. He thinks that she went out and played around on him and got pregnant. Because he's going, I know I didn't do it. So he don't, he don't know what to do. He said, I, I, I can't have her making a shame out of my family name. Not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. He's going to divorce her privately. But while he thought on these things, be, see, he wasn't right in his thinking, man. Was he, man? Was he, man? Man, Joseph was not right in his thinking. Amen. You need counseling. You need somebody to help you think things through the right way. Somebody say amen. Don't act on your first impulses, men. Stop and think about it. Think about what to do. Think about what's right. And then go ask God. And then go ask your wife. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And he believed it. And she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Not a young woman, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I mean, if you can say God is with your family today. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. I want to tell you something. I, I don't think I've ever preached on Joseph, but Joseph was an incredible man. Number one, he knew not to touch his wife until they were married. Number two, even after she's pregnant and they are joined and they are married, he knew not to touch his wife until after she had given birth. Now you try holding back for that long. Joseph was an incredible man. Somebody say amen. We need some more Josephs in this world. Amen. That's the family. In Genesis 12, I want you to notice how God looks at the family. 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And watch this. And in thee, in thee, that means in Abraham's loins, his seed shall all the, he didn't say the nations. He didn't say the people. He said all the families shall of the earth be blessed. I want to tell you that if you've got Jesus in your family, your family's blessed. Somebody say amen. And if you don't have Jesus in your family, you need him. You won't, you won't make it through the deaths that will occur. You won't make it through it. Amen. My neighbor... They rented a trailer in front of us from Sterling and Gloria. They raised a daughter. The wife was never supposed to get pregnant. She's never supposed to have, have a child, and God gave her a child. She was the prettiest girl. And on her birthday, her 13th birthday, her dad bought her a four-wheeler and no helmet, didn't tell her how to drive it, and she took off in it and got killed. And her mama... I, tr I spent one day talking her out of suicide. She couldn't handle it. And I tried to impress upon her her need for God at this moment or she wouldn't make it. Now they moved shortly after that. I can understand that. You can't live in the same house. Somebody dies, you got to move away. And we haven't seen them since then. I don't know what's happened. But I will never forget that. And I will tell you. The loss of my father. And the loss of my granddaughter. I can tell you. That you cannot get through these things. Without the blessing. Of the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ. In your, in your family. Genesis 28, 14. God said, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. He said it again. And behold, I am with thee, and keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken up to thee. And I've got promises that God made to me that I've had times where I'm thinking, God, there's, you're not, it's not going to happen, is it? God, it's not going to happen. You're not going to keep your promise, are you? But I'm here to tell you that if God, God, if it's in your family, He said, I will never leave you and I will keep my promises to you. I, will, I promise I will. And I follow a God who I trust. And I know He's going to keep those promises that He made. I know He will because He's done it Millions of times before he's kept his promises and I know he's going to keep them for the future too. Exodus, see, I, can you imagine how much I was getting out of this last night? Exodus 12, 21, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb, a lamb according to your what? Families. Because every family needs to be protected by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Somebody say amen. Listen, when the destroyer, when the destroyer comes knocking at your door to destroy your house, to destroy your family, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your children, he'll see the blood and he'll know he cannot enter therein. Oh, I'm telling you this Bible, I'm telling you what. I was bawling my eyes out last night. Psalm 68, 6, God said it this way. Look at this! God said it the solitary in families. Those of you who were all alone. And had nobody. And had no place. God 
gave you a family. Woo! I'm happy today. I don't know if you can tell it. I'm so thankful that God has given me a family. Not just this family. And I don't care if it ends up being all my grandkids in Bethel Church and nobody else. I mean, I like y'all. Y'all are my family, just like these are my family. And when my, somebody in my family hurts, I hurt. When some of y'all hurt, I hurt. But God taketh the solitary. Those who are alone, those who have nobody, he gives them a family. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. You know, young people, listen to me for a minute. Listen. Rebellious children. When you rebel, and leave your family. Look at what the Bible says. You will dwell in a dry land. That means you will leave all of the blessings that you had when you were with your family. Do you hear me, young people? The young people that are listening online right now, I know the devil is just gnawing and getting at them like COVID, trying to steal them, trying to kill them, trying to separate them from their families. I have counseled, I don't know how many families on the phone, in this church, online, trying to help them because their children turn out rebellious and they leave the home and they turn out and the Bible says they're going to end up in a dry land and we know that. But you know what? Sometimes, listen to me, sometimes you got to let them get out there. Let them go and find out what it's like to be solitary and not have your family. You'll come back. You'll come back. Psalm 107, 31, Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. All of us poor people together, we're rich now. Amen? Because we're together. And this church family is not going to let you suffer being poor without helping you. If we can help people all the way across the world who sing praises to God and thanking this church, if we can help them, we're going to help you too. That's what family does, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you what, I was, you should have been, you should have sat with me last night while I was studying this out. Nahum 3, 4, because of the multitude, listen to this. This is who, this is who tears families up. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. What is the number one killer of marriages today? Whoredoms, fornication, online sex. People pulling up, using apps to find women and men to sleep with. Making it easy. 20,000 women in the St. Louis area available for you. You can just pick one you want. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 men available for you. And if you want a man, you can have a man. If you want a woman, you can have a woman. If you want a queer, you can get a queer. She destroys marriage. She destroys families, doesn't she? Don't let her in your house. Now, Ephesians, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Let this, if you're solitary, let this be your family. Can I, can I hear somebody say amen to that? If you like going to church here, say amen. amen. If you don't like me, say amen. Watch it, Roy. Amen. 
Bless his heart, he woke up. <laughs> Lynn, you got family here. Jim, you got family here. George, you got family here. Trish, you got family here. Everybody, I love you. Your family's right here. And, and we are a family. We get mad at each other. <laughs> throw stuff at each other. You should see my sister and me sitting in the back of a car for a six-hour drive to Arkansas. She hated me. I hated her. We didn't want her. I didn't want her touching me. I didn't want her on my side of the car. Sound familiar? That's family. You know, she's sitting right here. She came back to this church to be with family. Yeah, I'm glad she did. And we'll take anybody that God sends to us. Amen? Man, I got to quit. Turn to Hebrews 2, and I'm going to quit. <clears throat> I want you to see what God does for us as family. Hebrews 2, verse 10, for it became him. Jared, you keep on singing. That don't bother me a bit in the world. Amen? Lynn, you, uh, what's your name? D? I got so many family members, I can't remember y'all names. You got family here. She knows that. She knows that. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons, that's us, unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. That means Christ and us. We're all one family together. Look at this. For which cause? I want to stop right here. For which cause? He is not ashamed to call them brethren. I, you've heard me say, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our friend, our brother. And I was questioned on that by somebody. Somebody said, Jesus is our brother? Read your Bible. And he not only is our brother, he sits among us. He is in this house today and he is not ashamed of you. He said, this is my family. Don't you talk about my family. I'll pop you in the eye. If you mess with my family, I've got the power to throw you into hell. Amen. If you mess with my family or talk bad about my family or try to destroy my family, I am a mighty shepherd and I will take care of my sheep and I'll take my rod after you. I'll be like David. I'll come running after you, grab you by the beard, Save the lamb out of your mouth and beat you to death. Amen. Aren't you glad you got a family? God made God on Christmas Day. What he did was create a family. And that family was blessed by Jesus. And so will your family be as well. Let's pray. Father, I call you Father now. You, my Father, you're the one I have left. You're the one that never leaves me. And I am blessed and reverent and respectful. When I come into your presence, Father, because you are holy and you are right, and you are God. And I owe you respect. I owe you reverence. I owe you honor and glory. For being my father. 
And I thank you for Jesus, for not being ashamed to come down here and sit among us sinners and not be ashamed to call us his brothers. Father, I never had a brother. Always wondered what it would be like. But I've got one now. And he is a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. And I thank you, Jesus, for walking with me every step, correcting me when I was going astray, helping me when I was down, saving me when I was a sinner, forgiving me when I sinned, leading me, guiding me, telling me what to do, showing me which path to take. Show me who to be with. Show me who to stay away from. Jesus, I thank you for being there every day of my life. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless this church, including all the people that are online, including all the people, Lord, in Kenya, that, Father, we get to keep now. You saw fit, God, that we weren't going to lose them as our family. And that family over there needs help. And there's nobody to help them now. Nobody cares about them. Nobody loves them. Thank you, God, for giving us those brethren and those sisters in Kenya. They love this church. They love this, they love this church. And I thank you, God, for not taking this church away from them. Because they need it just like I do and just like these people do. Father, I thank you, Lord, for marriage. I thank you for my wife, for her blessing to me. I thank you for my family. And I thank you, Lord, for my family here in this church. I'm not ashamed to be their brother. I'm not ashamed to be their pastor. I'm not ashamed to be their servant. I love each and every one of them. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless them and walk with them as they go on their path and go on their road. Father, bless their families as well. And Father, help us as grandparents and parents, Father of children, never stop praying for those kids. Never stop praying for those kids to come back or to be saved. Never give up. Never quit. Never stop praying. Wrestle with you until you bless us, Father. Help us to be that way. Thank you, God, for visiting with us during this church service. We thank you, God, for Christmas Day. Father, we're not ashamed. We're not ashamed to say Merry Christmas. We're not ashamed, dear God, to worship the birth of our Savior. We thank you, God, for that. Bless this day, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.